Hey gang, this week's episode is brought to you by Bespoke Post and their must-have box of awesome collections. Bespoke Post partners with small businesses and emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods every month. No matter what you're into, Box of Awesome has you covered. From travel and outdoor gear to breezy summer styles and grooming goods, Box of Awesome has collections for every part of your life. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code GOODSEATS at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com, code GOODSEATS for 20% off your first box. Now, here's our show. I'll tell you where they're working on us pretty good, if they can get away with it, is they got a man like Crombeam, number 14, sitting right in the slot. Now, going in is Merrick on the face, on the draw against LaRouche. And LaRouche gets it back for us. And it's flipped up into the air, knocked down by Cleveland, kept in there, sent right back out again, and up against the boards goes Pierre. Now the ball, the puck comes in behind our... Uh, Crease, and we're trying to get it out of there, and we do. Here we come with it. Across to LaRouche. LaRouche going out, splits in between the defenseman, leaves one for Brian Spencer. Shot right in the navel. But he held on to it. Now Spencer again. And what a knockdown drag up battle. Right as a point. Slap shot. And up off to the right side it goes again. That was tried by Dennis Ochar. And now we're trying to keep it and going. And now they got a four on one rush. Four on one against this. Comes right out to go. And we stopped it. Oh, oh, oh. oh, are we lucky there? Do not ask me how they missed that goal. Now we're going to take a try. Pierre gets it up to them. They got a shot going. I want to tell you something. That's unbelievable how they missed the goal on us down here. And then what Pierre did to set that up for Monaghan was beautiful, wasn't it? You'll find more times than enough. The defenseman Rick Hampton goes down and Monaghan comes in. He's got one of the best shots on the club. Takes a look and puts it past the glove hand of Jules Melosh. And it puts the Pens ahead 2-1 to one at 5-22. Monaghan scoring his first goal of the Penguin. He should have had one last night because his father-in-law, Bernie Boom Boom Jeffreyon, was there to broadcast for Atlanta. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, gang, let's get into this. How you doing? It's uh, your pal, Tim, and uh, it's, of course, Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Yes, we are back from vacation. Thank you for indulging me for such. And, uh, oh, boy, have we uh, got a treat for you this week. It's hockey time. Uh, yeah, it's in the middle of the summer, but, you know, the, the hockey season truly never really ends. And whatever opportunity we have to go back into the crazy and wild and wacky history of all kinds of uh, professional hockey endeavors. We are uh, always uh, up for uh, doing so. And our pal this week, Gary Webster. Yes, you may remember uh, our previous conversation with Gary from, uh, geez, way back uh, two plus years ago, episode 111, when we talked about the All-America Football Conference, uh, the quote unquote league that didn't exist. Great book, great conversation. We urge you to to check it out. But Gary is back this week uh, as we get ready for uh, his uh, uh, impending release. Uh, we think it's sometime in October, but this book will be available, is actually available for pre-order uh, about the the story of, uh, of what we're going to get into. And it's the Cleveland Barons of the National Hockey League. Yes, Cleveland had a National Hockey League team, the Cleveland Barons. Two years it was in the 1970s. And uh, the book that Gary is uh, getting ready to release, now available for pre-order, is called The NHL's Mistake by the Lake, A History of the Cleveland Barons. And man, oh man, what a treasure trove this story is. The clip you just heard, uh, it gives you some indication of the, just the sheer uh, craziness and futility and the odd set of circumstances, both before, during, and certainly after the existence of the Cleveland Barons, uh, 1976 to 1978, two whole barely seasons uh, of professional NHL hockey. And it is a story uh, that's got so many different layers and elements to it. But let's set it up. The clip that you just heard there was from a, uh, a Pittsburgh Penguins broadcast, right? So Cleveland uh, Barons uh, footage, very, very difficult to come by. But this was a clip 
uh, from uh, October 23rd, 1977 on WPGH TV 53 in Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, the uh, the malapropisms and, uh, shall we say, uh, less than sterling call uh, by the gunner Bob Prince, well known for his Pittsburgh Pirates baseball calls and legendarily so. But, I, you know, I, I'm not so sure on on pro hockey, but what you heard there uh, and uh, uh, ably assisted by uh, color commentary uh, uh, head and a PR chief, by the way, for the Penguins, Terry Schiffer, Schiff, Schiffer, Schiffer, is a, a really good microcosm of the <laughs> just the craziness and the futility of the of the Cleveland Barons. If you couldn't discern it there uh, during the uh, this third period of this game, uh, won by the by the uh, Penguins uh, three to two ultimately in front of fifty nine hundred and ten fans rattling around an 18 plus thousand seater known as uh, Cleveland's, uh, I guess it was a wonder facility at the time, the Richfield Coliseum. Uh, That's uh, Prince describing what essentially was a four on one break for the Barons uh, to score, Uh, not a power play, a four on one, just pure play for four, four players to one uh, against the goalie for Pittsburgh. And they still didn't score. And then right after, in the next sequence, the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins scored on Cleveland. You can hear in the background uh, not only sort of the incredulousness of uh, Messrs. Prince and Schiffer, but also the the, the fans nearby. The, you can hear them booing and, and lamenting and 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 and, and cursing and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I could not have found a better uh, encapsulation, I think, of the. Uh, the madness that was this crazy Cleveland Barons two-year sojourn in the National Hockey League. Uh, I'm going to let our pal Gary Webster sort of get into it. And it, it, this is uh, this is one of those you can take notes and it's, it's great. But you know the beginning of this story uh, from our episode, very first episode ever back in 2017 with our pal Mark Gretschmill, uh, as well as our episode number 37 with our uh, other pal Steve Currier, uh, when we got into the story of the Golden Seals, California Golden Seals, Oakland Golden Seals, various names, right? That was sort of the the uh, beginnings of this Cleveland Baron story, because at the end of the Seals' life, and the, that, again, is just chock full of uh, intrigue, uh, it was decided that they were going to come to Cleveland and find greener pastures. Well, uh, that didn't happen, Let's uh, shall we say. And this is a story... Uh, that has sort of multiple facets to it. There's the Richfield Coliseum component, 35 or, I don't know, 25 miles away from downtown Cleveland, actually closer to Akron. They still couldn't draw flies. The story of uh, just futility on the ice, uh, the story of inability to, to draw fans, the the lack of marketing, the change in ownership after one year, the Gund family coming in and uh, being local heroes and still couldn't themselves uh, make a go out of this franchise. The... Um, just the sheer, um, I guess, just ambivalence for a whole bunch of reasons. And we'll get into those. Um, the then uh, emerging uh, after that two year sojourn into another struggling franchise, the Minnesota North Stars, something that we uh, discussed with our pal Adam Rader back in our episode 53. Um, and in essence, uh, the merging of uh, two flailing franchises, the Barons and the North Stars, to essentially become the sort of next generation version of the next uh, the North Stars uh, and uh, the uh, basically the sunsetting of this Cleveland Barons franchise and 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 the diaspora of all of that stuff. Right. Is it with the San Jose Sharks with their with the guns uh, finally came back, if you will, to the Bay Area uh, after the Seals had left? Uh, is it with the Dallas Stars? Uh, where uh, the official sort of relocation of the Minnesota North Stars wa- occurred uh, about two decades ago. Um, I, it, you know, uh, it, does it maybe reside with uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, which essentially brought NHL hockey back to Ohio? Who knows? But we get into all of that and much, much more. A, a fascinating, overdue and uh, uh, illuminating conversation with our pal Gary Webster. We're going to talk Cleveland Barons hockey. It's coming up in a few moments' time. You will enjoy this, uh, and uh, I look forward to presenting it to you in mere moments. How about a few promotional items to get us in the mood, shall we? Uh, Let's talk about OldSchoolShirts.com. Promo code GOODSEATS for 10% off all of your purchases. 
Uh, lots of great stuff. As you know, it's not just about sports at OldSchoolShirts.com. It's it's radio stations. It's shopping malls. It's all kinds of local culturalisms, uh, television station logos, etc. cetera. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the beating heart, if you will, of OldSchoolShirts.com is their tremendous uh, shirt collections around all kinds of teams and leagues no longer with us. Of course, the Cleveland Barons uh, are there for you, a beautiful, uh, not only shirt, but you can get all kinds of different versions. Uh, it's red with the Cleveland Barons logo, uh, all there for you at oldschoolshirts.com. Promo code good seats, 10% off all of your purchases, not just that shirt, but all anything else you might find there. Oh, and by the way, you'll also find a shirt um, commemorating the team that preceded uh, the Barons, which is actually integral to this story, the Cleveland Crusaders of the World Hockey Association. Great logo and colors in, in their own right, uh, also available for you to find there, too. And uh, stay tuned again for our conversation, because the Crusaders and the WHA very much part of the uh, the foundational story of why the Barons wound up in Cleveland. Uh, so we thank our pals at OldSchoolShirts.com. Again, promo code good seats for 10 percent off all of your purchases. And once you're done there, you want to go to Royal Retros. Yeah, that's the formerly known as 503 Sports, but RoyalRetros.com and the promo code for you there uh, is SEATS uh, for 10% off all of your purchases there. Uh, and the best place, the only place, I think, really, to find a an amazing custom-made Cleveland Barons jersey. You can get it both in the away red uh, and the gorgeous sort of, uh, uh, I, I guess it's, I guess it's like a burnt red kind of color, maybe crimsonish, uh, or you can get it in the home white. Um, and there are a couple of different uh, versions of that. There's the logo version. Uh, you can get the uh, the Barons uh, 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 wording, a uh, uh, dia uh, dia dia. What am I trying to say? D- uh, diagonally. That's what I'm trying to say <laughs> across the top uh, uh, in the front. Uh, and yes, of course, you can get your uh, name. Uh, emblazoned on the back and customized all that, all kinds of different sources uh, and, uh, excuse me, sizes, he says. Boy, I gotta, I'm so excited. I can't get my words straight. Uh, you want to get a little captain logo on there. You want to get the alternate captain uh, A there on there. All of that is capable uh, within the uh, boundaries of what uh, our friends at Royal Retros can do. And again, that's royalretros.com, promo code SEATS for 10% off that, as well as anything else. Lots of great jerseys, lots of great shirts, and other kinds of stuff from all kinds of leagues and teams at royalretros.com. Promo code SEATS for 10% off your purchases there. So thank you both to royalretros.com and oldschoolshirts.com. And um, we uh, are ready uh, and uh, uh, anxious and eager and uh, excited to let's go with this conversation. Here we go. It's our conversation we had just a couple of days back with Gary Webster, let's talk about the Cleveland Barons, shall we? Here it is, please. Enjoy. When we um, sort of last uh, were chatting, we were in the uh, the realms of uh, of football and, and Cleveland in there. I, I get the sense that um, that Cleveland is very much near and dear to your heart as a subject to explore when it comes to sports teams, Yeah. Well, I mean, I've lived my entire life here, and I've been an Indians fan, or a Browns fan, a Cavaliers fan. So, um, yes, I really am interested in in delving into the the sporting past. Now, for the book that we're going to um, discuss, I used to be a much more avid hockey fan than I am now, and mainly the reason was in uh, in 1992. Uh, Cleveland lost its hockey team, its international hockey league team, and uh, went for like 10 years without any hockey. And, and really, from the mid-70s on, I my interest in the sport had cooled. And I really can't tell you exactly what it was that made me decide to sit down at the microfilm and start looking into the two-year history of the Barons, but I mean, this is something that happened in, in my lifetime. I was 20 years old when the Barons came here. And so I remember them well, and I, I just thought it might be interesting to look back on one of the, unfortunately, uh, great sports disasters 
not only of of this community, but frankly, uh, in all of of major league sports, the Cleveland Barons were just a, a two year laughing stock. Yeah, well, and that actually, you know, that kind of uh, uniquely uh, capitalizes its importance uh, when we come to look at topics that we want to pursue. Uh, because, you know, I, we started this show, what, four plus years ago, I must say on a whim, but certainly on a on a premise or a, a supposition that a lot of our explorations would be uh, sort of in this category of tragedy or serial comic or you know, best intentions uh, gone awry and that kind of stuff. But, you know, certainly not all of them have come out that way. But this, I think, certainly qualifies. I, I, I want to maybe sort of get into the sort of uh, the tr- the two tributaries uh, of this Baron story. Because I, I think there actually are two of them. Number, number one, of course, um, as we've talked about in various or previous episodes with uh, our pals Steve Currier and Mark Gretschmill about the California Golden Seals and and that that's probably the, the most obvious but there was also this World Hockey Association uh dalliance mm-hmm. with Cleveland uh in the uh I guess 4 years immediately prior to the arrival of the Barons do you want to use uh those two uh topics as kind of the as the the table setter uh for this Cleveland Barons oh, yeah. story we're getting into yeah, Tim, absolutely. That is what I um, wrote the, the first chapter about, uh, what happened to the Crusaders and how it was absolutely imperative that the Crusaders vacate Cleveland before the Golden Seals could move in. So I I do uh, spend quite a bit of time, even after the Golden Seals had moved here, I, I just felt because I had talked about the Crusaders and such detail, I did spend a little bit of time talking about how the Crusaders, who ultimately became the second incarnation of the Minnesota Fighting Saints of the World Hockey Association, and how they um, eventually went belly up midway through the 1976-77 season. And uh, I certainly do uh, mention the the Golden Seals as well, at least a, a brief Store a history of uh, how they floundered badly in the San Francisco Bay Area before deciding Cleveland was their salvation. And then, of course, the crux of the book is how it uh, turned out Cleveland was not their salvation. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, too, because I think to the, the outside observer, now I grew up in the Northeast, I currently live in, in the Chicago area, um, certainly aware of Cleveland and its uh, very strong and long-lasting sports history. But I, I'm quite surprised that the more I learn and go back into uh, professional hockey, in particular the NHL, but certainly the WHA is, uh, too, uh, why Cleveland hadn't gotten uh, a real taste of top-tier professional hockey uh, prior to the 1970s, right? I, I think most... Um, most people obviously recognize too the NHL itself is only, if you will, uh, the the quote unquote original six, only six teams for, God, since the end of the world, the Second World War, all the way until like you know late 1960s, right? So there wasn't a lot of expansion mindedness there, but but you know I, it's interesting because it seems like Cleveland was always kind of regarded as a, a somewhat perhaps natural market for uh, NHL hockey, or certainly hockey generally, but I, I'm just surprised that it took so long uh, for Cleveland to get uh, one and if not two professional franchises and not until the 1970s. Well, in my first chapter, I and I didn't know this myself until I started doing the research, Cleveland had a chance to join the National Hockey League in 1942. Um, The Barons were invited to join the National Hockey League in 1942, and they said, thanks, but we're not interested. So I can go into detail about that if you would uh, would like to. So I'm guessing that was a minor league uh, Barons-named team? Yeah, the Barons of the American Hockey League, uh, they go back to 1937-38. So they had only been... In the, in the American Hockey League for five years at this point, but they had averaged in the 1941-42 American Hockey League season, 
believe it or not, the Barons had a higher attendance average per game than the New York Rangers did. That's very interesting. And so there was interest on the NHL's part in adding Cleveland and adding the uh, the Buffalo Bisons of the um, AHL. And it, it did not happen because the owner of the Barons said, look, if I leave the American Hockey League, the league will be destroyed. My team is the flagship franchise. And if I leave the AHL, my fellow owners are going right down the tube. So I'll be out of business. I can't do that to them. So I'm staying here. That's interesting. And and, and I think it's put in context, right? The Barons of the AHL, um, you know, won, I think, was it like nine Calder Cups back in the day? The team started in 1929 and, and lasted all the way until 1973. So talk about an essential and foundational and, and, and uh, bedrock franchise, right? These... AHL Cleveland Barons. Yes, yes, exactly. And that makes the the ultimate um, demise of the American Hockey League Barons a very sad thing to witness. And I do go into that in the, the first chapter of the book, because the Barons and the Crusaders tried to coexist in 1972-73, and that just wasn't going to happen. So it was a very sad ending for a very proud uh, Cleveland Barons team in in the the, the winter of 1973. So in essence, the it was the World Hockey Association uh, construct of uh, the recently departed Dennis Murphy and friends, a, a two time guest on this show, and luckily we get, we got to him before he uh, uh, he passed uh, away last week. Um, I, I get the sense that the WHA was not uh, unaware, I guess, of the longtime success of this a- AHL franchise. And in their own, I don't know, special uh, 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 thinking that Cleveland was, quote unquote, ready <laughs> for a top tier professional hockey franchise versus that of an AHL one. Well, they, the WHA was certainly aware of Cleveland's hockey background, but the reason Um, Cleveland wound up in the WHA is because an overture to the the NHL had been rejected. The NHL was expanding like crazy in uh, the five years between 1967 and, and 1972, and Cleveland tried to get in and was rejected. So that left uh, Nick Maletti with no place else to turn for Major League Hockey, but to the WHA. And the WHA said, sure, we've got 11 teams already, but it would be good for us to have a market the size of Cleveland. So come on in. Interesting. And um, so, but that's obviously a, a scene setter, right, for for how the Barons ultimately sort of wound up there. I The, the Crusaders... And I know this is where we're kind of want to focus on the Barons, but the Crusaders, they were they were they played their first two seasons at the Cleveland Arena, right? Which I guess is in downtown Cleveland. Yes, yes, they did. And then there was this Richfield Coliseum thing, right? Which I think is an important sort of uh, thing to sort of bring up in in this conversation because maybe you can describe it for our audience. We've kind of hinted at it in some previous Cleveland conversations, but. Um, it's integral to the story, right? It's obviously where the Barons wound up playing, but uh, it was an arena that was built. I, I don't know if it was specifically built with the Crusaders in mind, but um, it, it's clear that it was it, it was envisioned as being a future home for not only hockey but basketball. Um, but on the outskirts of Cleveland, right? It wasn't even close to downtown. No, it. Uh, well, the, the sports writers around here used to call it the big house on the prairie. And without it, without it, um, the Golden Seals would never have moved to Cleveland. And um, it was partially responsible for the, the demise of the Crusaders and the Barons, simply because, yes, it was 
Um, it's not exactly equidistant between Cleveland and Akron. It actually was closer to Akron than to Cleveland. But the big problem, and I went to the Coliseum many, many times. I spent a lot of time there, um, not so much hockey, but, but basketball. So I remember what it was like trying to get to the Coliseum and what it was like trying to get into the parking lot and even more so what it was like trying to get out of the parking lot. The problem was the Coliseum was, but there was only one access road to the Coliseum. Whether you were going east, west, north, or south, there was only one access road to the Coliseum. And if there was any kind of crowd at all, it was a nightmare trying to get out. And Tim literally, um, well, I, I was there the night in 1976, the miracle of Richfield year. I was there for the seventh game, Cavaliers and Bullets, 20,273 people. And my my buddy and I, literally, we just said when the game was over, let's just sit here until Lord knows when, because we know what it's like trying to get out of this place. We literally sat in the building for an hour and then went to our car and sat there for another half hour until the parking lot was like half full. And then we decided to leave, trying to get out of the Coliseum, if there was any kind of crowd at all, was an absolute nightmare. Yeah, obviously constructed with the burgeoning automobile in mind, right? Um, and I guess uh, more of a regionalized kind of approach versus that of just sort of being in just the this, uh, Cleveland uh, uh, city uh, limits specifically. I mean, you're mentioning Akron. I mean, Cleveland obviously is part of a sort of a, uh, a still growing sort of environment that that has sort of smaller markets and cities sort of within reasonable reach, right? I guess maybe this was, I don't know, uh, Richfield was kind of envisioned maybe a little, a tad bit earlier than its time. Well, the grand plan, I mean, Nick Belletti had a grand plan for the Coliseum and you hit the nail right on the head regionalized. Maletti envisioned his Cavaliers and the Crusaders becoming regional teams. People would come from Akron to watch the games. People would come from Youngstown to watch the games. People could even motor on up from Columbus to watch the games. And Canton to watch the games. Maletti even envisioned basketball fans coming from Pittsburgh to watch the Cavaliers since they had no team in Pittsburgh. Maletti envisioned that the Coliseum would be the hub of a complex that would eventually include hotels and shopping malls and movie theaters and restaurants because the Cleveland area was moving south, the Akron area was moving north, and right there in the middle of all of this activity would be the Richfield Coliseum. And it never happened. And now when I when I drive past there, it's it's strange to look at where the Coliseum used to be. It's now just empty space. Nothing was ever built around the Coliseum. Nothing. Nothing that Valetti ever envisioned came to pass. None of it. Yeah, and Maletti was it was, was a power broker in many respects, right? Because he was the founder of the Cleveland Cavali Cavaliers, also owned the Soon to be renamed Cleveland Indians, uh, and you know, and and own this AHL Barons franchise, right? So you'd think that he, if anybody could be influential in making stuff happen, it would have been him. Well, I mean, the idea did not seem far fetched. It really did not seem far fetched. And Maletti did make one thing happen, which was the Coliseum itself, because the Coliseum was built with one hundred percent private. Funds. Not one penny in tax money was spent on the Richfield Coliseum. So that was a miracle in and of itself. Um, Maletti got that building built without having to go to the taxpayers to ask for any money. It was completely financed privately. All right. I don't want to harp too much more on the Cleveland Crusaders because, frankly, that's probably your next book. And I look forward to having a conversation with you about that. <laughs> Because uh, uh, Lord knows that logo is great and, and, and this story is. But I do, I do want to close with one last part on this this part of the story, right? So, and it involves, frankly, how Cleveland wound up getting the Golden Seals. 
Um, Maletti owned the team. Then he sold it in 75. And then this guy, Jay White, sold it back to him in 76. And and then literally almost like a month or two later, I think, if I have the time right, uh, the NHL uh, somehow decides to move to Cleveland. And I, I did Maletti. I guess the question is, what did Maletti know and when did he know it? Um, and frankly, it sounds to me like it was the NHL finally coming to Cleveland and then he recognizing his now newly owned, re-owned Crusaders had to get out of town because he didn't think he could compete there with the NHL. Is that, do I have that right? Well, it's, it's a very long and, and convoluted story, and I do uh, talk about it in some detail in the book because it all ties in together. The bottom line was until the World Hockey Association sent um, the legal counsel of the National Hockey League uh, a letter stating categorically the Cleveland Crusaders no longer exist. Cleveland is no longer in the World Hockey Association. Not until that documentation was received by the NHL did they say, okay, now the Golden Seals are free to move here. We needed absolute proof from the WHA that this was no longer their territory. So the Crusaders were gone. It was not a question of Maletti realizing the Crusaders couldn't compete with the Barons. The Barons would not, or I should say the Golden Seals, would not come here until they had documentation from the WHA. The Cleveland Cavaliers have been sold and moved out of the city. They no longer exist. The, uh, the, uh, the, the Crusaders, yeah. So, but all right, so let's, so is that Jay White's doing? Was that, Millett- I mean, and or was it true, right? Because um, it seems to be that there's some question as to whether the Crusaders in reality or, or technically existed. Because um, we know that they moved to, as you mentioned at the top, right? They moved back to Minnesota or moved to Minnesota to become the second version of the of the Fighting Saints in the WHA. But there was ob- obviously there was something to move <laughs> now that the Barons were coming. I'm just wondering under what pretense, false or otherwise, that that um, understanding that the Crusaders were quote unquote no longer Cleveland in the WHA was true or or you know concocted. Oh, it was it was true. There was no concoction involved. Now, well, first of all, the, the guy that you're referring to, his name was Jay Moore. Jay Moore was the guy who bought a majority ownership in the Crusaders from Maletti and found himself unable to make a go of the franchise. And ultimately, in the, the 1975-76 season, unable to meet the payroll and having to borrow money from Cleveland Trust Bank to meet the payroll. Among the embarrassing things that happened in the uh, final days of the Crusaders was the fact that when the Crusaders came into being in 1972, they absolutely shocked Clevelanders, first of all, and they shocked Boston Bruins fans by signing Jerry Cheevers to a five-year $200,000 $200,000 per year contract. The Bruins had just won the Stanley Cup, and Cheevers was the hero of the Stanley Cup uh, playoffs and the Stanley Cup finals, and then shocks everybody by jumping to the World Hockey Association. And the fourth year of Cheevers' contract was 1975-76. Halfway through the year, Jay Moore says, I can't pay you. I have no money to pay you. So they negotiated uh, a way for Cheevers to get out of the contract, and he signs back with Boston, a black eye for the Crusaders and a black eye for the World Hockey Association. So ultimately, Moore starts negotiating for the Crusaders with a man named Bill Putnam, who had been the president of the Atlanta Flames of the National Hockey League. 
The Flames were uh, an expansion team from uh, the 72-73 season who, unlike the Golden Seals, quickly became a successful playoff team. So negotiations between Moore and Putnam drag on throughout the summer of 1976. Ultimately, Putnam pulls out, Moore is left holding the bag, and so Maletti steps back in and purchases majority control of the Crusaders and decides, I'm either going to move the team to to Florida, which was Putnam's plan to move them to Florida, or I'm going to move them to Minneapolis, St. Paul. The Crusaders are finished. We are out of Cleveland, but I'm going to try to make a go of this team somewhere else so that Jay Moore and the minor investors can hopefully at least recoup some of the money that they have invested. Ultimately, Bill Putnam withdrew entirely, and the folks in um, St. Paul, Minnesota, emptied up enough money in season tickets to lure Maletti and the Crusaders to St. Paul, where they became the second incarnation of the Minnesota Fighting Saints. In a nutshell, that's what happened. It's really much more long and complicated and convoluted than that. But that's, in a nutshell, what happened to the Crusaders. Well, that, so that's really interesting stuff. And and uh, research alert, don't, uh, don't ever uh, solely refer, uh, rely on a Wikipedia entry to get especially names, <laughs> names right, like quote unquote Jay White, who apparently is not even a real person, I guess. But so Jay Morph, thank you for the correction. Um, and it's interesting. It feels like to me that Maletti is almost kind of like a white knight, uh, maybe pun intended, here, uh, in that he was essentially holding or re, uh, re gaining the rights to this franchise and knowing that uh, he, he needed to move it somewhere else. Uh, knowing that this Barron's thing was in motion. Well, it wouldn't be inaccurate to say Maletti did write in on a, on a white charger at the 11th hour. And again, Maletti himself said, I really don't want to do this. I was glad to have unloaded the Crusaders on, on Jay Moore because at this time, Maletti's entire sports empire was collapsing. He ultimately had to sell the Richfield Coliseum. He was forced out as club president of the Indians because the team was losing money hand over fist. Although the Cavaliers were successful at this point, this was the miracle of Richfield year. Um, That was marred by the fact that Maletti got into a blood feud with his head coach, Bill Fitch, during the playoffs. His entire uh, sports empire was collapsing. He did not want to take control of the Crusaders, but Moore didn't have the money to continue operating the team, as I mentioned. He um, had had to go to Cleveland Trust Bank to be able to meet the payroll at the end of the 1975-76 season. So Maletti, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, said, I will take over and I will find a new home for this team. Hopefully, we can make a go of it wherever that new home happens to be, whether it's Hollywood, Florida, which is where Putnam had wanted to move the team. Sure, the Sportatorium down there, the legendary Sportatorium. Yes, the the Sportatorium, yes. Either I move it to Hollywood or I sell it to Putnam and he moves it to Hollywood. And if that doesn't happen, and it didn't happen, then the folks in um, St. Paul have a chance to step up and get the franchise. They did, and Maletti was hoping he could make a go of it there so he could at least reimburse more and some of the minor investors some of the money that they had invested. He really had no hopes of giving getting them all of their money back, but he hoped to reimburse them some of the money they had lost on the Crusaders. And ultimately, the second incarnation of the Minnesota Fighting Saints went out of business in January 
1977, and that is how the Cleveland Crusaders ceased to exist. They became the Minnesota Fighting Saints. The Fighting Saints went belly up halfway through the 1976-77 season, and that's the end of what started out as the Cleveland Crusaders in 1972. Yeah, and and uh, not unique given the history, the checkered history of the World Hockey Association. I, yeah, I'm curious. Did you ever reach out to Maletti? I know he's still with us. I don't know. I think he's kind of going to be 90 years old by now, right? Um, an interesting sidebar for our, for our listeners. He was also part of the short-lived Las Vegas Posse of the Canadian Football League when they were doing the uh, American Team thing in 1994. But I digress. Um, but he, that's got to be an interesting story in in its own right. I wonder if he's still. You know, uh, not only around, but potentially, uh, uh, you know, uh, a decent memory to kind of go into that. I, You know, it's a stretch, but uh, I wonder. Yeah, I have not had any success in trying to, to get in touch um, with him. And my understanding like from the local sports writers who have done the same thing, it's uh, basically he does not want to talk about it. But um, I will I'll continue trying it because. Yes, if the memory is still there, it would certainly be interesting to find out his take on all of these things as his world, uh, as he reached the peak. I own the Cavaliers. I own the Barons. I own the Crusaders. I own the Cleveland Indians of Major League Baseball. And I got the Richfield Coliseum built. Yeah, you have, you have and then it all- with some radio properties, too, right? He did. He owned uh, WWE, which broadcast the Indians games and the Cavaliers games, and the Crusaders games. So I uh, forgot to mention that. Well, the yeah, had and, and I think get- also, yeah, the home of uh, the, uh, the old Pete Franklin sports line show. My goodness. I, I, right. I don't know if Don Imus was on that show, was on that, that station too, maybe. I forgot. I spent many, many hours in the early and middle 1970s listening to Pete Franklin sports line. I certainly did. And then it all it all collapsed. And to get his explanation for how all of this happened would be a fascinating thing. All right, we're making a note. Uh, we'll we'll put that on the on the sidebar. But let's get to the let's get to the Barons because um, uh, maybe you can kind of get us into how they arrived. Uh, I, I have, according to my research, uh, the NHL approving the move of the Golden Seals to Cleveland uh, in July of 1976. Uh, I guess it wasn't finalized until about a month later or so. Um, what's your understanding of how the how Cleveland was selected and the move was made, and and why Cleveland from from Oakland? Well, to to kind of paraphrase what I'm about to explain, Tim, the Barons are a case study in how not to relocate a major league sports franchise. Everything that could have been done wrong was done wrong. Uh, to, to take just a, just a moment to explain about the California Golden Seals, they were born in the first round of NHL expansion. And the franchise was a mess from the day it was born. It could not attract fans in Oakland, and it was a horrible team, and it played in uh, a substandard building. And what happened was uh, the Golden Seals were eventually purchased by a name that will sound very familiar to anybody listening to this podcast, I would certainly think anyway. After a couple of years, the Golden Seals were purchased by Charles O. Finley, the guy who, of course, owned the Oakland Athletics uh, during their heyday in the early 70s and and into the 80s, Finley couldn't make a a goal of the Golden Seals, although he was the guy responsible for the name being changed from the Oakland Seals to the California Golden Seals in hope of uh, expanding the fan base. Things got so bad, in fact, that finally the NHL, to get rid of Finley, bought the team from him and operated the team for a couple of years. In 1975, the team was purchased by uh, three businessmen, Mel Swig, who lived in the San Francisco area, 
George Gund III, who was a native Clevelander, but was then living in the San Francisco area, and a guy named Bud Levitas, who bought all of 2% of the stock, and whose name is mentioned like half a dozen times in my book, because Bud Levitas was not a factor at all. So it didn't take long for Swig to decide that the team was not going to be successful in Oakland unless, and this is a lament we hear in all sports and have heard it for, for many, many, many years, unless I get a new building, I can't make a go of it. This building is too small that we play in in Oakland, and it's antiquated, and I can't make a go of it here. And after the 1975-76 season, Swig decided, I've got to get a new home for my hockey team. There had been discussions with San Jose to build a 16,000-seat arena, which would have saved the team for the Bay Area. When those discussions fell through, Swig turned his uh, eyes toward Denver. There was uh, a great deal of interest in Denver, which had just lost its World Hockey Association team. Denver, in 75-76, had been given a WHA expansion team, which left town after three months and moved to Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, which had already lost one WHA team. After three weeks in Ottawa, the team simply went belly up. So Denver was now in the market for an NHL team. Denver had uh, a spanking new arena called McNichols Arena, which was publicly funded and therefore owned by the city. A guy by the name of Bud Palmer, who was a sportscaster in Denver, was the front man for the group trying to get the Golden Seals to move to Denver. What happened there was this was also the time, the summer of 1976, when the NBA was in serious negotiations with the ABA to merge the two leagues. And a guy named Carl Shear, who was in charge of the Denver Nuggets of the ABA, was very busy with those negotiations to merge with the NBA. Shear was supposed to be the money man to bring the Golden Seals to Denver. And Shear said to Bud Palmer, I can't be bothered right now. The Nuggets are my priority. I got to get the Nuggets into the uh, NBA. So forget about it. I'm, I'm out of it. I'm not going to supply you with any money to bring the NHL here. That left Bud Palmer with no investors. And that left Mel Swig without Denver as a possibility for moving his team. So that left the Richfield Coliseum. Sitting plan, here between plan, plan C, if you will. Plan C, if you will. The Coliseum sitting in between Cleveland and Akron, quite possibly, and having seen the building, although I hadn't seen any other hockey or basketball arenas, but having spent time in the building, it was a beautiful building, state of the art, everything so modern it hadn't even been invented yet. And the Coliseum was privately owned. It was not owned by the city of Cleveland. That made a difference. Uh, The uh, research that I have done indicated that when a building is privately owned, the owners have much more leeway in terms of negotiating a lease to make concessions that a city-owned building doesn't have. So the Coliseum is privately owned and It's sitting here, and the Cleveland Crusaders are making noises about moving. So, and to make things even more interesting, George Gund III, who owns 38% of the Golden Seals, is a native Clevelander. And he suggests to Swig, you ought to move the team to Cleveland. They got a great building there, and Cleveland has a, a long history of supporting hockey. It would be a great idea to move the team to Cleveland. So with Denver now out of the picture, Swig decides to investigate this. This is all transpiring 
within a roughly 30-day period, that 30-day period being the month of June of 76. Now, Tim, if you own a professional sports franchise, a major league sports franchise worth millions of dollars, of course, today they're all worth billions, but we're talking about 1976 here, worth millions of dollars, and you're thinking of moving it to a new community, don't you at first do some homework about this community that you have never visited yourself? Melswig knew nothing about Cleveland. George Gunn III did, but Swig is the majority owner, and he knows nothing about Cleveland. And he doesn't bother to learn anything about Cleveland. Because he he was getting desperate because the clock was ticking towards the new season, maybe? Well, the, the, the clock is ticking. And now Swig still had two years left on his lease at the building in Oakland that the team played in. So it wasn't like I have nowhere to go. He can go back to Oakland. If he leaves Oakland, he's going to have to buy his way out of this lease. But that is an ugly situation because by now the fans know he tried to move the team to Denver and that didn't work. Now he wants to move the team to Cleveland. If he comes back to Oakland out of desperation, who's going to go to these games knowing that in two years or less, the team is gone. So that is really not a viable alternative. Now, Swig does not know anything about Cleveland other than what George Gunn III has told him. He knows they have a nice building. He flies to Cleveland late in June of 76 to tour the building with Gunn and with um, an attorney who represents the owners of the Coliseum. Well, that's all Swig needs to decide, I want to move my team here. This is a great building. I want my team in this building. I want my team in this building next year. How fast can we do this? So by the end of June, they have negotiated a lease. By the end of June, Clarence Campbell, the president of the National Hockey League, and the other National Hockey League owners are satisfied. The WHA has abandoned Cleveland. It is an open market. We can move in here with no possibility of litigation down the road from somebody saying, hey, that's our market, and you invaded it, and you owe us money. They are convinced that this is not a possibility. The WHA has said, on paper, Cleveland is not a WHA city anymore. So by the end of June, there is a lease negotiated on the Richfield Coliseum. And Swig goes to the uh, NHL Board of Governors and says, I want to move the team there. Basically, he has support for that move. There are uh, a couple of snags, because when you're talking about Cleveland, there are always uh, a couple of snags. These wind up getting worked out. And the NHL, uh, let me see here. I should have this information right here in front of me. I believe it's on the uh, 14th of July, officially gives Swig permission to move his team to Cleveland. Yeah, here it is. On the 14th of July, the Board of Governors makes it official, and the California Golden Seals are now relocating to Cleveland. Swig admits, boy, this was a whirlwind. It really happened fast. And there are a couple of things that I probably should have looked into, but there just there just wasn't time. One of those things being, how about possible local investors? And Swig says, well, you know, I haven't talked to anybody, but George is going to handle that. George is going to see if anybody in Cleveland would like to invest in our hockey team. And George Dunn III had not talked to anybody about investing in the hockey team. So right away, you've got the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. Yeah, and the buses are all gassed up, ready to go. 
right? <laughs> In fact, even before this July 14th date, when approval was officially given by the NHL, um, Swig had already moved the front office staff to Cleveland to start selling tickets for this team that they didn't officially have until the middle of July. So not looking into potential investors is one mistake, although Swig may have thought he didn't need any investors because Cleveland was going to be the land of milk and honey, and they're going to beat down the doors to the Richfield Coliseum to watch my team. And so I don't really need any other investors. That may have been his line of thinking. But the other big mistake was he didn't talk to any civic leaders in Cleveland. He didn't talk to the mayor. He didn't talk to the um, Cuyahoga County commissioners or the Summit County commissioners with the Richfield Coliseum being located in Summit County. He did not speak to any civic leaders about, hey, I'd like to bring my hockey team here. Um, let's, let's discuss this, okay? He didn't talk to anybody. He just moved the team to Cleveland. And the operative word here, because Swig used it a lot, was hope. I hope the fans will welcome my team. I hope we'll draw well at the Coliseum. He hoped a whole lot of things. But the term that we would use today is due diligence. And nobody lifted a finger to do any due diligence before moving the team to Cleveland. It happened within uh, a six-month period. On June 1st, nobody was even thinking about the California Golden Seals moving to Cleveland. By July 14th, they were here. All right, what's this? Box of Awesome. Oh, man. Hey, this summer, Bespoke Post is here to take your adventures to the next level with their new lineup of must-have Box of Awesome collections. Bespoke Post partners with small businesses and emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods every month. Uh, I have been uh, lucky enough to receive one of these uh, boxes, and the one I chose is called the Weekender, uh, and it's a gorgeous uh, overnight bag. Uh, in uh, beautiful colors. Uh, mine is in olive with uh, brown trim, uh, but the, it comes in all kinds of different colors. And it's just perfect for those weekend getaways. Uh, you don't need uh, sort of that valise or that uh, overnight garment bag or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it's, it's fantastic. And it comes from a, a company that I never would have heard of uh, called Line of Trade. And they've really done a gorgeous job with this thing. And I've been using it uh, literally the last couple of weeks for all my little travel uh, needs and and so no matter what you're into, Box of Awesome has you covered. From travel and outdoor gear to breezy summer styles and grooming goods, Box of Awesome has collections for just about every part of your life. Now, uh, I notice a whole bunch of other ones. If you're sort of into bourbon sampling, if you're an outdoorsman, uh, if you enjoy sort of uh, uh, on the go uh, beverages, especially uh, when you're out there in the hot sun, uh, perhaps you uh, you're a big taco fan. Uh, and you want to sort of reinvigorate your uh, your process of uh, of creating and uh, and uh, enjoying uh, taco night at your own home. All those and many many more. So fantastic and very creative things. It's clothing. Some of them are food related. Some of them have to do with uh, personal grooming. They're just awesome, literally uh, and figuratively, collections of stuff. Uh, and uh, they're yours uh, to peruse and subscribe to. And it's a, it's a tremendous concept. And uh, again, box of awesome. It's uh, it's something that you can take advantage of. To get started, you take the quiz at boxofawesome.com and your answers will help them pick the right box of awesome for you. They release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories, as I just hinted at to you, and it's free to sign up. Plus, you can also skip a month or cancel at any time. Each box costs only 45 bucks, but it's got over at least guaranteed to be over $70 worth of gear inside. It's a really cool concept. Check them out. And of course, we've got an incentive for you to do so. Get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code GOODSEATS at checkout. Yes, that's boxofawesome.com, promo code GOODSEATS 
for 20% off your first box. Thank you, Box of Awesome. And uh, please, uh, let's enjoy the rest of our conversation. Also, uh, part of this story, right, is is the Coliseum itself, right? Because um, if I have this right, it, not only state of the art, but this was for hockey. Uh, I think the largest capacity of any now team in the NHL, a big cavernous eighteen plus thousand seater, right? Which, um, geez, talk about pressure, right? <laughs> right? To fill those seats. Yeah. It was 18,544 seats, which was bigger than any building then in the National Hockey League. And boy, do they have trouble filling it. Well, I mean, the bottom line is, in two seasons, they never did. Only once did they draw more than 13,000. Out of 80 home games, only once did they draw more than 13,000. So only once did they have as few as 5,000 empty seats. Normally... They had thirteen to 14,000 empty seats. A lot of good those seats do when nobody is sitting in them. Well, they also didn't have uh, a great lead time, right? So uh, assuming, you know, how this sort of transfer sort of occurred June, July, August of, of 76, right? You have a season that starts in what? Early October. Um, that's a, a – that's a – I, I at least they had a semblance of a team. I'm sure the the uh, the players and the coaches and all that stuff. I'm not sure all of them sort of uh, were on board to make a move across halfway across the country. Uh, but still, even even though they had those resources uh, behind them, if you will, um, it still was essentially a a start from zero, if you will, in terms of market awareness, uh, in terms of a schedule, in terms of. Uh, you know, I, all of it, right? So uh, three months, not even, right? And that is hardly amount of time, enough time uh, to get media deals and ticket sales and establishing a base and community relate, all that kind of stuff, right? It sounds like they were kind of snake bitten right from the very get go to even have a hope of uh, even growing into that role uh, very early in their first season. And all of that is part of the, the lack of, of due diligence that I was talking about. Yes, you get here officially July 14th, and the season starts the first week in October. Your training camp is going to start early in September, so you have about six weeks before training camp. And in this time, you have to start selling season tickets, and most importantly, you have to start marketing, of which the... Barons, I guess we can probably start calling them the Barons now. It was uh, late in July when the official announcement was made that the team would be renamed the Cleveland Barons. The Barons did almost nothing in terms of marketing. Maybe it's a, a little early in our conversation for me to mention this, but I, I say in the final chapter of the book, in the epilogue, as I try to explain exactly why the team failed so so spectacularly, I think one of the problems was, and again, as I mentioned, I was 20 years old when the Barons came here, and I've been a sports fan since I was eight. I had been a fan of the original Barons, of the AHL, and I followed the Crusaders, at least their first couple of seasons, I did kind of lose interest after after the second year. I've been an Indians fan since I was eight. I've been a Browns fan since I was eight. I've been a Cavaliers fan since the day they were born. And here is the the fundamental difference between the Cavaliers and the Barons. The Cavaliers were born here. The Barons, to me, and I think to many people in Northeastern Ohio, the Barons never really felt like they were our team. The Cavaliers were born here of expansion, and they were horrible the first season of their existence. They were, they were lousy for their first several seasons, but they were our team. They were born here. The California Golden Seals came 2,500 miles across country and showed up one day and said, 
the National Hockey League is here. So everybody get down on your knees and kiss our feet and love us, love us, love us, because the National Hockey League is here. And in Cleveland, that doesn't work. That doesn't go. And I think that might have been the overriding factor to everything else. The Barons just showed up, said, boy, are you lucky to have an NHL franchise, so love us to death. And Clevelanders said, uh, no, not happening. It doesn't work that way in Cleveland. It was like, I don't know if you recall um, when the Cavaliers won the NBA championship back in 2016, uh, LeBron James said it. In Cleveland, everything is earned. Nobody gives you anything. you got to earn it. And the Barons didn't want to earn it. They were the NHL. You were lucky to have them. And we want to be loved. We want to be loved right now. Did not work out that way. So the, not only did they get off to a bad start, both on the ice, but uh, also at the gate, but, but um, Swig... Uh, you know, essentially starts. I, it's interesting. It seems like it was undercapitalized from the very beginning because key uh, key moment in time, right? Early nineteen seventy seven, just not even halfway through the season. Uh, you you've got uh, Swig going to the board of governors saying, I, "I need a bailout already." Right, uh, mere months into the first season, how does something like that happen? Is it under capitalization? What, what, I mean, was he de- that dependent on the gate, right out of the gate, so to speak, uh, to, to, to keep cash flow? I mean, it just seems like there's not enough money sort of like to kind of operate the team going into what essentially is a kind of a startup environment. Well, Jim, um, that is the longest chapter in the book. And that chapter probably put my research and journalistic skills to more of a test than I have had in any of the other assignments that I've taken on. That chapter runs for like almost 60 pages explaining what happens to the Barons at the midway point of the season. Now, as well, far don't, as... Don't under- give too much away. We want people to buy the book, <laughs> for God's sake. So, but, well, we do. But, we do. But, but essentially, right, uh, It's it seems like if it was a normal logical, rational ownership approach, having little to no money and having, uh, uh, I guess the word even liquidation was even, it was floating around. H- how does it go in six months to get to that that bad so quickly? Well, um, first of all, I just want to mention one thing which kind of ties in to this. You talk about being undercapitalized. I truthfully don't know how undercapitalized Swig may have been. I I do believe that he was very much dependent on the gate receipts, which were not coming in. For example, the Barons' very first game, when you would have expected a huge crowd, quite possibly a sellout of 18,500, they didn't even draw 9,000 to their first game. So that was a a red flag right there. But earlier than that, and we were talking about marketing uh, a moment ago, for the savvy fans, something happened that probably clued them in right away to how the Barons were going to operate. It was suggested by the local media, especially the, the two Cleveland newspapers, that it would be a good idea if the Barons could acquire some familiar players because Clevelanders don't know any of these guys. These guys have been transplanted from Oakland. Unless people followed the NHL, they didn't know these guys who are now our players, Cleveland's players. There were a couple of former Crusaders who were on the market and available, one being Paul Schmier, who had been the World Hockey Association's top defenseman the previous season. But Schmier was caught in the the problems of the Crusaders. The the ownership could not pay him what his contract called for. And so the Cleveland writer said, hey, 
Schmier came from the Golden Seals to the Crusaders. He is still on your negotiation list, so why don't you sign him? The fans would love to see this familiar face. He was very popular with the Crusaders. The fans would love to see this familiar face in a Barons uniform. And the Barons um, general manager, a guy named Bill McCreary, said, no, 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 no. Schmier makes too much money. We can't pay that kind of money. It would upset everybody on this team because it would just totally upset our salary structure. So, no, we're not going to sign Paul Schmier or any of the other ex-Crusaders. They all make too much money. So right away, the fans of the Barons are clued into the fact that Mel Swig either doesn't have it or isn't willing to spend it, one or the other. So what happens is at the all-star break of the 76-77 season, the Barons are not doing well, not drawing anybody to the Coliseum. And Swig goes to the meeting with his hat in his hand and tells the Board of Governors, as you said, I need cash. Now, the way the Cleveland papers reported it, um, the, the uh, Barons had a payroll that was to be met in the middle of January. And Swig said, I'm not meeting this payroll. Nobody gets paid until we get this problem resolved. And the problem is, I need more cash. So the Cleveland writers naturally ask, are you broke? And Swig's response was, no, I have plenty of money to meet the payroll, but I'm not going to do it because I've already lost more money than I had uh, budgeted to lose. I came to Cleveland knowing that I would probably lose money this year. But man, we're three months into the season, and I've already last, lost more than every penny I budgeted to lose. And this has got to stop. So I have the money to meet the payroll, but I'm not going to do it. The league is going to have to help me. And that um, started about a, a six-week period where nobody got paid. The players didn't get paid. The coaches didn't get paid. The people who really suffered were the front office staff. These people aren't making a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, the players were not making that kind of money in those days either. I should say seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year. The front office staff wasn't making that, but Swig wasn't paying them either. And negotiations went back and forth and back and forth. And every day it was, oh, there's a new plan to save the Barons. And all the plans just fell through. Oh, there's another plan to save the Barons. No, that one just fell through. And the players threatened to, to go on strike. And the players also said, if we don't get paid by such and such a date, we'll declare ourselves free agents and we can sign with anybody. And, of course, uh, Clarence Campbell said, the heck you will. You will not be free agents. If this team goes under, you will be subjected to a dispersal draft. Alan Eagleson, the president of the Players Union, said, oh, no, they won't. They'll be free agents. And the, the union will back them to the hilt. So it's a mess for six months. Are the Barons going to survive or aren't they going to survive? Ultimately. They they did, and it was Eagleson who came up with the money, borrowed the money to give to Swig on the condition that Swig used it for player salaries and nothing else. The, uh, the Players Association borrowed $650,000, and Swig put up, I believe it was $350,000, and the league put up 350000 and with that $1.35 million, Swig was able to make it through the rest of the season. It's so, much, so essentially, much, essentially, much, essentially, I'm sorry, Gary, essentially a bailout with a significant concession granted by the Players Association, uh, this when Alan Eagleson was a noble character. <laughs> yes, yes, I have read about uh, Mr. Eagleson since 
I, I wrote the book, and uh, yes, I, I know he is. No, I, isn't he the only person to get kicked out of the Hockey Hall of Fame, Jim? Well, yeah, and for 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 very good reasons. And uh, we, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he was a noble character then. Now Eagleson had already been on record at this point. First of all, Eagleson told the players, "It's my recommendation because um, Swig had talked about cutting everybody's salary." by as much as 27%. Now, he would give that money back at the end of the season somehow, and if he didn't, then the players would supposedly be able to declare their free agency. But Swig was on record as saying, I want you, I know you don't like this, I know you don't like having your salary cut, but I think you should accept this because the bottom line is, it's important to keep the team going until the end of the year because there are players on this team who, if it folds, will be out of work. Yes, some of you will wind up on other NHL teams. Some of you will be out of work. You're not good enough to play for any other NHL team. He didn't use those words, of course. But the point being, I wish you guys would consider the big picture Consider the fate of your teammates. It is to everybody's advantage to keep the Barons going for the rest of the year. And then we'll liquidate the team and we'll be, we'll be done with it. And who knows if it had come to that, what the players ultimately would have decided. But yes, it was a bailout. And um, the money was used to pay the players' salaries. The Barons lasted till the end of the season. Some of the players... Some of the players were really very angry. They wanted the team to go under because they wanted to get the heck out of Cleveland. I mean, they've been told, when we leave Oakland and come to Cleveland, you're going to have 20,000 people in the stands for every game, and it's going to be great and fantastic, and this is going to solve everybody's problems. And, in fact, things just got worse, and the players were tired of it. A guy by the name of Al McAdam was quoted in the paper after the bailout as saying, I think I'm just going to quit. I don't want to play for this team anymore. I'm sorry they bailed it out. I wanted this team to fold. I want out of here. So some players were really very angry that the team survived. Well, yeah, and they obviously finished uh, last in their uh, Adams division. But uh, interestingly, uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised that they were able to sort of keep it together. They weren't they weren't the worst team in the league. I mean, they were certainly near it. But, I mean, the Red Wings, for example— had only 16 wins that season in the Norris division, right? The mighty Ritwings. Wings. So, I, you know, I, I think it's a testament to the players to kind of, you know, soldier on to the extent that they could and win at least that many games, albeit, you know, in last place, right? They did finish in last place in their division, and they finished with the fifth worst record in the league. Fifth worst out of, um, I believe there were 18 teams in the NHL that season. The Bears were the fifth worst. So uh, knowing that that's sort of in place and, and that at least the the salaries are covered for the rest of the year, I'm guessing then it, it didn't help. Uh, there, there probably wasn't any money left over for anything related to marketing or getting people to go to the, go to the games and that kind of stuff. Um, I got to think the wheels were in motion then now behind the scenes to get uh, new ownership or new life into this franchise once the season was over then, no? That's true. There was very little done. Uh, well, actually, Swig did ante up $100,000 for marketing for the remainder of the season, but it was a given. Uh, and and some, of the, some of the players had actually said, if Swig continues to own this team, we want out. We will never play for this man again. And... Swing didn't want to own the team anymore. It was one enormous headache for him. He wanted to get rid of it. The problem was who would take it off his hands. Now, when the 76-77 season ended, the day after the season, um, the Cleveland Press, I believe it was the press, had a rather extensive interview with Clarence Campbell, the NHL president, who said, as far as I'm concerned, the Cleveland Barons no longer exist. They cease to exist as of the end of yesterday's schedule. Mel Swig has lived up to his financial obligations. The league has lived up to its financial obligations. The Cleveland Barons, as far as I'm concerned, 
no longer exist. So that's how, how dire the situation was. Either new ownership had to be found or the barons were going to be liquidated. And there was only one viable potential owner, or I should say two viable potential owners, which were George Gund III and his brother Gordon. Both native Clevelanders, Gordon at that time owned no stock in the, in the barons. His brother owned 38% of the barons. And if somebody was going to save the barons, it was going to be the Gun brothers. If they didn't do it, then the barons were history. It was all over. And why did the guns step in to do it then, given the that one that 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 lead up, which was hardly a lead up, right? Yes, I think it was basically out of loyalty to the community. Now they didn't live in Cleveland any longer. They both maintained uh, George and Gordon both maintained residences here, but they no longer lived here full time. But they still had a number of connections to the city. The family's gun foundation still exists and still gives millions of dollars every year to uh, charitable causes in the Cleveland area. Their father had been a pillar of the community. They had grown up watching hockey here. And I think it was essentially out of loyalty to the community they they realized if the barons are going to be saved, we have to do it. Again, the negotiations were long and drawn out. Eventually, uh, they came to fruition in June of 77, and George Gund III and Gordon Gund became the owners of the barons, I believe. I know they, they bought out Swig. I believe they also bought the 2% that uh, Bud Levitas owned. And I don't know where Bud Levitas spent all this chaos, maybe just sitting back thinking, I'm glad I only own 2% of this mess. It doesn't involve me. So the Gun Brothers take over with great optimism. They make a promise that they will keep the barons in Cleveland for at least three years to try to make a go of things. And that's a statement they ultimately wound up regretting. Well, what, what happened? I mean, they certainly gave it, they certainly injected a lot of new life and enthusiasm and marketing and, and, uh, 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 and, and uh, excitement, I guess, around the sort of, I guess, reincarnated, uh, Barons for this second season, right? Yes, they did. They knew how to run the franchise. They spent money on it. They marketed it. Uh, they did everything right. They really did. Well, there was one strange thing about the agreement that the Guns signed to own the team, and that was actually. The agreement had to be approved by a man named Sandy Greenberg, who owned the Coliseum. And for some reason, even though the guns owned the team, they had to go through Sandy Greenberg to spend money on the team. They had to get Sandy Greenberg's permission. And they Greenberg, wanted to Greenberg, be Greenberg, I'm guessing had now purchased, had gotten the the Coliseum from from Nick Maletti, right? Who had probably had to sell it. Yeah, Got it. Yeah, he had. He, uh, at this point, Greenberg owned ninety percent of the Coliseum, and the other ten percent was owned by um, the, the Kettering family, I believe, of uh, of Dayton. But Greenberg owned ninety percent of it. Maletti was now totally out of the picture. But this convoluted sales agreement required Greenberg to greenlight any money that the guns wanted to spend on their own team. So that hamstrung them for a few months. They finally changed the agreement in January, giving the guns the right to spend their own money on their own team. And other than that strange agreement, 
the guns did everything right, but the team was still terrible. The the two two top draft choices were total busts and contributed nothing. The number three pick showed some promise and wound up getting traded. So the Barons continued to lose. The fans continued to stay away from the Coliseum. And by the, the, the guns had set aside and shown this to the NHL. When they bought the team, they said, we're setting aside $2.3 million to run the team next year. So that we're not going to go to the NHL with our hats in our hands and ask you for money at the All-Star break. Well, throughout the season, Alan Eagleson, who had uh, come to the rescue of the team in the spring of 77, as early as November, as early as November, we're a month into the season, and Eagleson is saying for public consumption, the Barons aren't going to make it through the season. They're going to fold. The Barons will fold, people. Hockey in Cleveland is dead. The, the, sec- are going the to second fold. year in a row he's had to say this. Well, um, he he wasn't really so vocal about it the first year. But the second year, again, as I said, in one month into the season, the guns are trying to build something here. And when, when Eagleson said that, the guns were absolutely furious. How are we supposed to build something here when the president of the Players Association is telling our fans the team is done? It is going to fold. And they denied that it would fold. It did not. However, ultimately, Eagleson knew what he was talking about. By the time the All-Star break came around in 1978, the Gun Brothers had already spent that $2.3 million they had budgeted to run the team for the entire season. But they didn't go to the league and say, we need cash, because they were not broke. The Gunn family was extremely wealthy. They could absorb any imaginable loss from running the Barons. And they did. And after the season, the Guns admitted When we went to the league meeting at the All-Star break, the board of directors expected us to say, we are folding the team. But we didn't. We kept the team going for the remainder of the season. We had no intention of folding the team, even though it was our own personal fortune now we were spending to keep the team going because nobody was coming to the games and the $2.3 million that we had budgeted, we had already lost that. We had already spent that but we were not going to fold the team. And they they didn't. But then the question became, after the 77-78 season, and again, the Barons finished, I believe, with the fifth worst record in the NHL, how long are the Guns going to be willing to lose the kind of money that they lost in 1977-78? All right, so, so you, 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 you have two ownerships now in the span of two years, right, that have not been able to succeed. One somewhat arguably undercapitalized and, and kind of maybe not knowing what he was getting into. A second year with well, well-capitalized uh, local residents. So before we sort of get into the denouement of this, right, because that, that this also is a fascinating sort of and I wouldn't even call it a cul-de-sac because it's it's in some respects it's still kind of we'll, we'll get to sort of where the the history of all this gets domiciled. But the um, what are the reasons that you're able to discern here as to why two separate groups from two different perspectives still can't make a go of it? Is it is it the arena and the and the fact that they don't control their own lease? Is it uh, the, the 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 location of the arena because it's outside of at least the Cleveland uh, 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 city limits and arguably outside of Akron that as well. It's in the middle of both. You know, it's inconvenient for both of those metros. Is it uh, a, 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 a somehow lack of television and or uh, radio or, or or exposure 
Uh, is it the league itself, right? Because the Minnesota North Stars, which is an important part of the end of the story, are, are similarly floundering. Um, is, is it the league maybe having expanded too quickly or maybe getting a hangover from its aggressive, nonstop uh, expansion that kind of really got going in earnest in 67, 68, right? Which was itself maybe trying to make up for lost time, having waited so long for, you know, 25 years to actually get expansion going until the late 60s. I, or maybe it's all of those things. I don't know. Well, Tim, it, it's kind of a tangential thing, but you're talking about the expansion. I do mention in the book the, the craziness of the expansion. Now, the NHL had its original six teams, as you mentioned earlier, from World War II until 1966-67. Well, by this time, baseball is expanding, football is expanding, basketball is expanding, and there is a demand for more NHL hockey. There are big cities out there that wanted NHL hockey, but the expansion just happened so fast that in a 10-year period, if you include, and of course you have to include the WHA, in the spring of 1967, when the NHL season ended, there were six major league hockey teams. Ten years later, between the NHL expanding and the World Hockey Association coming into being, there were 32 major league hockey teams, quote, unquote. And that is just mind-boggling to, to try to wrap your brain around from six major league teams to 32 in 10 years, much too fast. Certainly, that had something to do with it. As far as the location of the building is concerned, that's legitimate. Let, let, let me ask, have you ever been to Cleveland and, and seen the Coliseum? Uh, back when, yeah, well, yeah, back in the day, uh, vaguely remember it, but I also remember it, it was, what, 30, what, miles out of the city of Cleveland, something like that? It was about 25 miles away from downtown Cleveland, about 15 miles away from downtown Akron. The, the big problem with the Coliseum was it was used mainly for winter sports, for basketball, for hockey. And northeastern Ohio in the winter is not a pleasant place to be. I've lived here my entire life. But believe me, northeastern Ohio... November, December, January, February, March, is really not a pleasant place to be. The Cavaliers proved that the Coliseum was not an obstacle that could not be overcome because when they made the playoffs in 75-76, what we here in northeastern Ohio still call the miracle of Richfield year, even though we have since had an NBA championship since then, but 75-76 is still the miracle of Richfield. For, for old-timers like me, they drew capacity crowds because they were winning and playing exciting basketball. So the Coliseum was not an insurmountable obstacle. But when you put a bad team in the Coliseum, and not only a bad team, but a boring team, because the one thing that caught your eye about the 77-78 Barons, they couldn't score. They averaged, for most of the season, two goals per game. Not only can you not win scoring two goals a game, you're not going to draw fans to watch you score two goals a game. They were bad and they were dull. And people were not going to drive down Interstate 271 in a snowstorm, in an ice storm, to pay what they thought were unfair places to watch a lousy hockey team. Yeah, no but, public transportation really either, too, right? No, no. I, I think I think eventually the, the Greater Cleveland RTA did start running special buses to the Coliseum, but essentially no regularly scheduled um, public public transportation. I think a lot of it was the perceived arrogance of the National Hockey League. Now, during, during the 76-77 the season, 
one of the Cleveland newspapers did conduct a poll and ask the fans, how come you're not going to the games? What is it about the Barons that is turning you off? And they printed the results, and there were like 10 different things. But one that really stuck out was the NHL is perceived as being arrogant. It was like I said earlier in our chat. The Golden Seals showed up in July of 1976 and said, we're the NHL. We're the best there is in the sport of hockey. And now, you lucky Clevelanders, you've got a team. Here we are. Kiss our feet and love us to the tune of 15,000 fans a game. And Clevelanders were not going to do that. But they perceived the NHL as being arrogant and very full of itself. And they didn't like that. That, that attitude didn't work. They just were not uh, humble. And it wasn't like, we, we will welcome you. Don't show up here and say, we're here. Welcome us. Throw us big parties and 15,000 fans a game. We're here. So love us, love us, love us. And, and that didn't work. And that really did, it might sound bogus, but that really did turn off a lot of people. But to, um, to get to the, the denouement, as you said, uh, I do have an epilogue in the book in which I, I try to sort of wrap it up in a nice, neat little package, what the, the myriad reasons may have been for the Barons failing. But it all goes back to the lack of doing the homework. When, when Swig sold the Barons to the Gund brothers in June of 77, he admitted upon leaving Cleveland for the last time, he admitted, I did not have good information when I came here. I think this could have been avoided if I would have had the information I needed, but I didn't have it. His own fault. He could have done his homework, but he didn't do it. They didn't do the due diligence. And then the Gund brothers, after the second season, commissioned what has now become known around here as the infamous survey. And they surveyed people in Northeastern Ohio. Uh, I don't know who they hired to conduct the survey. I know they paid $25,000 for it. I said in the book, for the mere expenditure of $25,000, the whole disaster that was the Cleveland Barons could have been avoided Swig could have saved millions. The guns could have saved millions. All they had to do was what the guns did after the 1977-78 season. They spent $25,000 to hire some survey polling organization to find out how many people in Northeastern Ohio are interested in the National Hockey League. And what they found out was almost Nobody. The survey said, if I may quote a famous game show, the survey said of the people who consider themselves to be Crusaders fans, only 8% of them said they were interested in the Barons. Only 8%. And that ultimately is the reason the guns gave for merging the Barons with the North Stars. The survey said Northeast Ohio just does not want this hockey team. They don't want it. They don't care about it. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Very interesting. Well, so uh, the uh, let's talk about sort of the final chapter, if you will, in that regard, right? So the guns actually were... I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we're, we're pretty instrumental in creating the exit strategy that ultimately went down, which was the aforementioned Minnesota North Stars. And we've had Howard Baldwin on this show, uh, and hopefully we'll have him back again in, in a couple of months to kind of pick up where we last left off. And, and he sort of is involved later on in sort of the North Stars and, and their sort of 
history. But but the this basically was sort of set up as look, the North Stars are are flailing, which also seems relatively strange given uh, how just deep and and rich a hockey uh, heritage the state of Minnesota has, right? But that's a, for another story for another day. Um, I guess the guns kind of uh, saw that you have two franchises now that are literally going to collapse. And wouldn't it be better perhaps if maybe just one of them went away versus both of them going away, right? So uh, do I have this right? The guns were kind of the engine behind this, don't call it a merger, merger of these two teams? (laughs) Well, Tim, as, as I understand it, what set the whole machinery in motion was um, sometime in the spring of 1978, George Gunn III was in, I believe it was, was um, uh, now I can't remember if it was in Austria or in Czechoslovakia, for the World Hockey Championships. He was a dyed-in-the-wool hockey fan. And also attending the World Hockey Championships was the owner of the Minnesota North Stars. So their paths crossed and they both started, you know, commiserating with each other. The the Barons were last in the league in attendance. The North Stars were 17th out of 18 teams, although their attendance was more than twice what the Barons had drawn. And it pretty much unfolded the way you explained it. Here are two teams that are going down the tubes. The Barons lost three million dollars in 1977-78 and the guns had no intention of throwing another three million dollars uh down the the sewer in 1978-79 so can we take and the the north stars were also not a very good team can we take these two lousy teams and merge them into what might be uh an average team a team that might contend for the last playoff spot and a team that might draw some fans in Minneapolis. Can we do this? And as I understand it, the idea, they both liked the idea. Uh, Gunn did and the owner of the North Stars did. And it proceeded from there. It was something that had never happened in the NHL before, two teams merging. The Board of uh, Governors said, yeah, it's fine with us. And so in June of 1978, the merger was announced. The team would be known as the Minnesota North Stars. It would be based in Minneapolis. And the Cleveland Barons no longer existed. So in in essence, I guess, the guns essentially, I don't know, swapped ownerships of their teams and kind of became basically the owners of the North Stars and then essentially let the the Barons kind of be the ones to go away? Well, yes, the Guns uh, did become the majority owners of the North Stars. And all the Barons players were merged with with the North Stars roster. And it's a matter of, come training camp in September, how many of these former Barons would make the North Stars. And some of them did, and some of them uh, did not, but I believe all the Barons players, except for two who were uh, released to other organizations, became part of the North Stars, and it was up to them to make the team come uh, training camp. But yes, the Guns did become the majority owners of the North Stars. And a dispersal draft and all that kind of stuff essentially was then to allow them to stock their new North Stars team? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of, of a dispersal draft. There there may have been one, but it, it's my understanding that basically you took the Minnesota roster and the Cleveland roster and you squished them together and you had one roster, which became the Minnesota North Stars. And again, it was a matter of in training camp, which of these guys will make the team? Some of the players who once were Barons will become North Stars, and some of them won't be good enough, and they'll get cut. Um, that is is the way um, the way I understand it. But I may be um, 
not correctly informed about that. Well, I, look, to be honest with you, you can be forgiven because there seems to be lots of, um, I mean, this is where the tributaries and the uh, the branches of this river uh, kind of sort of go in, in, in various places. So uh, this has been eye-opening and, and very interesting. And obviously, we've had, like I said, previous conversations about um, uh, the Golden Seals uh, sort of at the beginning of this. Uh, we've uh, we've talked about the Minnesota North Stars with our pal Adam Rader back in our episode number 53. Um, but maybe let me try to encapsulate sort of a, a, a an exit strategy for us in this conversation, right? Um, and let me couch it sort of, let me couch it sort of as this. Um, I, I don't know how many uh, card carrying, uh, uh, Cleveland uh, Barons fan club members there still are out there, right? But let's assume there are a couple, uh, maybe maybe present company included. Um, where, logically or illogically, would you say, given the work that you've done to put this story, you know, out there, does the Cleveland Barons, I don't know, official or uh, you know even assumptive history? live right because you could make arguments that it died and it doesn't have any history good riddance but the reality is it, it actually was part of a lineage right and that lineage as we sort of leave or get off of this part of the story right goes to the minnesota north stars or at least portion of it and then that story right the minnesota north stars right itself breaks into two later on guns involved uh some of it going to the dallas stars uh, and some of it going to the, ironically, the San Jose Sharks, which the guns were involved with um, uh, bringing uh, the hockey literally back to San Jose when it was after it was originally thought about in the 60s with, with, the, with the Golden Seals. So, um, I, and arguably you could squint even harder and suggest that maybe because of now the geographical proximity of the let's call it next generation Columbus Blue Jackets, that perhaps there is where it could be, yeah, somewhat elegantly sort of at least remembered or nodded to. I, I, the question in there is, if you're in a story in which you are, you, which you, you can't avoid right now because you already are one right now, Gary, so congratulations. Where do you think the Barron's history could and should effectively live? Well, Tim, uh, first of all, uh, let me say I, I take great pride in being a, a sports historian. I love doing it. One of the reasons that I wrote this book is because I, I really believe it's an interesting story, but I also felt that the fact that Cleveland was in the National Hockey League for two years should not be completely forgotten. Totally agree. Because I, I can tell you nobody around here talks about the Cleveland Barons. Once this book is published, and again, it, it's kind of hard for me to believe, because as I mentioned, I was 20 when we got the Barons. It's kind of hard for me to believe that this all transpired 40 years ago, um, more than 40 years ago. Once the book is published and I make the rounds of the uh, meet the author nights at bookstores and libraries and such. I really expect a lot of people to come up to me and say, I never knew Cleveland had a national hockey league team. I never knew that. I would be willing to bet that a very large portion of the, the population, even those who consider themselves sports fans don't know that Cleveland had a National Hockey League team for two years. And I wanted to keep that fact alive. I think that um, that deserves to be known. As to where the, the Barons would fall in terms of um, the, sort of the pecking order of, of Cleveland sports, obviously they would be at the very bottom of the list, I would have to place them. I would have to place them with, if not tied with, maybe maybe even, 
even well, no, I would have to say above only because of the fact that we're talking about the National Hockey League. Correct. Um, right. We're not it, talking about the AHL uh, predecessor or the team that came back as the Barons that I think Howard uh, the Guns actually uh, brought back right in, in the minor leagues after this debacle. Yes, they did. They 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 bought the uh, the Lexington Kentucky team of the American Hockey League and moved it to Cleveland and renamed it the Barons. And um, the, the gentleman who owns the Cavaliers now, Dan Gilbert, owns the Cleveland team of the American Hockey League, which did win the American Hockey League championship, won the Calder Cup back in, in 2016. And the one thing Dan Gilbert made it perfectly clear when he, uh, I don't think he started the team from scratch or if he purchased the team and moved it here, but he made one thing perfectly clear. This team will not be called the Cleveland Barons. We've had enough of the Barons. So I would place the Barons just above the Cleveland Stokers of the middle 1960s who were uh, a British soccer team. I, I, Gary, them. I'm going to stop you right there because that, that is another book you need to do. The One Year Wonder Notes. <laughs> well, actually two years. Yes, they were Stoke City from uh, masquerading as the Cleveland Stokers of the old United Soccer Association, as you probably know by perhaps listening to this show, absolutely right up our alley. And um, talk about something that is also lost to history is absolutely that story. And uh, I was I was 10 years old, 9 years old, and 10 years old when we had the, the Stokers, and soccer did not mean anything to me, and I have to confess, I'm still not, not a soccer fan, just does nothing for me. But I know... They played in front of um, uh, a few stray pigeons and nobody else at Cleveland Stadium for two years, and the investors lost their shirts on it. Really, I would place the Barons just above uh, above the Stokers in terms of uh, Cleveland sports history. I'd have to put them behind our indoor soccer games, the, the, the Force. The Force and the Crunch, and yeah. Crunch, because they were very popular. Clevelanders really went for for indoor soccer. So the Barons would probably come up in next to last place on the the, the pecking order of Cleveland sports in in my estimation. And as I said, I'm expecting to run into a lot of people when I uh, hit the road to promote this book who are going to look at me and say, I never knew Cleveland had a National Hockey League team. We just, we don't talk about it. It's it's something we want to forget, and the book explains why. Yeah, it's also interesting too. Um, I, I, you know, and again, I, you could even throw in the Pittsburgh Penguins, right? Giving their regional, relative regional proximity uh, as a place. I, I you know, it's it's just. Um, I, I think it's it's also the question is also kind of loaded, right? In that it's it's a two year experience that just about everybody involved with or remember kind of wants to forget. Uh, I, it's interesting too because I think the design of the the, lo, of the uh, logo and the uh, the jerseys those are actually pretty cool looking and and perhaps there's a retro component to it. But you know there are throwback games and all kinds of leagues and and teams and stuff and the NHL is no different. Um, I, I guess just it just the and perhaps apropos of nothing, right? If if there was ever a desire to somehow at least acknowledge the Barons' existence in some kind of commemorative way, and maybe in today's sports world to make some money off of the old logos and the jerseys and stuff, right? For a hefty price. Who would be best served and or logically suited for that? Would that be the Sharks, right? Given that that's where half of the North Stars diaspora went, or would it be the Dallas Stars where the kind of other half kind of went? I Maybe... I just, having just thought about it for a moment, you could maybe give them give the tie to the uh, the sharks only because of the guns' involvement in that a decade or two later, right? And effectively, perhaps maybe being sort of a round trip, if you will, of this Golden Seals to Barons to ultimately back to the Bay Area kind of thing, but 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 only. Only a very narrow victory <laughs> in that regard. Now, again, I, who's going to do that? I don't know. Um, if people do start to pay more attention to this story that you bring back to their attention, um, I don't know. It's an interesting 
quandary that, you know, where should that history live, right? People like the Hartford Whalers, right? And that, that lives on, right? They're obviously a more popular and revered franchise back in the day. But, you know, the people in Carolina, they want to use it and, and and monetize it. And the people in Hartford are pissed off that, that they're absconding with their, their history, right? Um, but to me, that kind of stuff is actually, it's not academic. I think it's actually kind of important. Yeah, the Barons are probably relatively lamentable in all of that, but still, if there's a Barons, if there's a Barons jersey, if there's a Barons piece of history, if there's if there's a logo, a sign that gets uh, uh, excavated, somebody's uh, uh, estate sale yields a whole bunch of me- Barons memorabilia. It should go somewhere, and if it's not, say, the National Hockey League Hall of Fame, which team does it go to? Uh, you know, I know it's kind of a a a, a a moot point or question, but I think it kind of matters, frankly. And it goes back to what you said earlier. This is history that happened and sad as it might be, or lamentable as it might've been, you can't forget it because it it happened. And if the NHL is going to go on and pro hockey is going to be a thing, you can't ignore and whitewash this. You gotta, you gotta have, it's got to domicile itself somewhere and descending uh, soapbox. (laughs) I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, the Cleveland Barons existed and the, the California Golden Seals existed. The fact that the team ultimately was merged with the North Stars does not change the fact that for 10 years, the Golden Seals slash Barons were probably the National Hockey League's biggest pain in the butt, probably their biggest headache, but they existed and therefore what is the the family tree? The the seals to the barons to the north stars to to the stars. I think you are right in that the, the stars are probably the closest living relative, but the fact that the Gund brothers eventually wound up back in the San Francisco Bay Area and deciding, hey, we want to get back into hockey. Let's get an expansion team. And they were given one. Part of the Barons belongs there as well. And I I don't mean to be evasive, but I I think part of the Barons belongs in both places. Probably the the lion's share, though, being in Dallas. From, From Oakland to Cleveland to Minneapolis to Dallas. That is the real family tree of which the Barons were a part. Just fantastic. Our thanks to Gary, and uh, you must uh, get this book. It is available uh, from our friends at McFarland Books, and uh, it will be officially out, uh, we believe, sometime, I think, the first or second week of October. But you can pre-order it now, and I urge you to do so, so you'll be the first on your block. Sometimes these uh, dates kind of move around and move up uh, a bit, uh, so you want to be the first in your neighborhood to get this book. Uh, and again, it's called the NHL's Mistake by the Lake, a history of the Cleveland Barons. It is available for pre-order uh, at McFarlandBooks.com or uh, on Amazon.com. And uh, most convenient way and perhaps uh, a great way to share a little love uh, for our little show uh, is to just search up our uh, episode number 225, this one, with Gary Webster on our website at GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. And uh, you will find a convenient link to this book to pre-order it, probably at the uh, lowest price uh, humanly imaginable. Uh, And it will also be probably the quickest way that you can get access to this book once it is officially released. Uh, We got a couple of shekels of referral love. We appreciate that. It's a great way to help support the show. We thank you for that. Uh, But by all means, this book is, uh, you're going to just devour it. And uh, it's um, it's the book that's been waiting to be written, right? The Cleveland Barons. Who remembers them? And uh, of those who do remember them, do you remember all the craziness and the wackiness? Uh, just a great topic, a perfect example of what we love to do here on this little show for you each and every week uh, to the best of our abilities. And uh, plenty more episodes uh, that you just may have missed 
uh, available for you to stream, to search, to uh, see great photography around, uh, perhaps buy books or, or movies and stuff from uh, at our website. Again, goodseatsstillavailable.com. You'll see every stinking episode we've ever done. Of course, the easiest way to make sure that you don't uh, miss out on any episodes going forward uh, or have the access to our library is to subscribe to us or follow us, for God's sakes, wherever you get podcasts. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just easy peasy. Just look for good seats still available. And there we are. Voila. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, what else? How about following us on social media? You can do that. How about on uh, Twitter? You'll find us a good seat still uh, on Instagram. You'll find us a good seat still available. And on Facebook, you will find us on or at good seats still available. Uh, email is uh, there for the taking as well. Hello at good seats still available dot com. Thank you for uh, those uh, pieces of notes and uh, input. We appreciate those. And uh, what else? Jerry Payne, you can't, uh, you can't deny the prowess uh, of the great Dr. Jerry Payne. Uh, Jerry Payne Audio Excellence. Thank you, kind sir, for all your uh, endeavors. And yes, we've got a newsletter too. Uh, just go to the website. You'll find a little link there uh, to get our little weekly updates of uh, what's in store for you uh, each and every week. And uh, we thank you for uh, signing up for that as well. All right, we're done for this week. My goodness, how much fun was that? And uh, we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. Get your shots, put your masks on, stay safe. And uh, until next week, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.